Father, we come to thy presence with the attitude of gratitude, Lord. Thank you so very much for uh, your presence, provision and protection in our lives, Lord. Especially, Lord, you have kept us safe and sound and have given us another opportunity uh, to come together through you, this virtual platform. As brothers and sisters in Christ, we come together to study your word. We ask for your leading and guidance as we spend the hour in your presence, Lord, discussing various theological matters. You open our hearts and minds so that we may be able to see the truth and may be able to relate to it and perceive it and receive it. And so that, Lord, we may be able to experience an intimate relationship with you as never before, Lord. The words of our mouth and the meditations of our hearts, Lord, may be acceptable in your sight. Thank you very much for listening to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, as you have all seen in the group, the topic we are going to discuss today is uh, sacrifice or sacrifices we talk about. I'm not going to deal with all the aspects of sacrifices, but uh, I would like to discuss about uh, the purpose of sacrifices. Uh, especially in a biblical, um, uh, especially from Bible, a biblical perspective about uh, sacrifices and its purpose. So sacrifice is the offering of material possession or the lives of animals or humans to a deity as an act of propitiation or worship. They, these are some of the definitions we find. Sacrifices are means of appeasing a god or gods or changing the course of uh, nature. So the sacrificial system, uh, the sacrifices are uh, wide varieties of sacrifices are there, but in all religions, majority uh, of them, they offer sacrifices in order to appease their god or goddesses. Uh, or uh, uh, there are religions who worship the nature. They offer sacrifices in order to please the nature itself so that uh, uh, there may be good rains and that there may not be any uh, calamities come upon them. So that is the reason many of them, they offer sacrifices. And uh, sacrifice is also a ritual-based worship. The sacrificial system is one of the oldest institutions in human history. If you take any culture, all the cultures, they have the sacrificial system in their culture and in their religions. And the sacrificial system is the center of all religions. As I said, it is not just a part of religions, but it is a major and it is the center of all the religions. And in some religions, the sacrificial system or the sacrifice itself is a very solvific act. The sacrifice itself saves people. If you take uh, uh, even Christianity, we all believe about uh, believe in the sacrifice that Jesus has made. The uh, act of sacrificing himself is a salvific act for us according to uh, Christian understanding. And sacrifice is the primary religious ritual that we find in the Bible. All the religions, they have a sacrificial system, especially if you read the Bible and uh, especially the Old Testament, we find the sacri we find uh, uh, the main way of worshipping the Lord is through sacrifices. And the sacrifices are offered for various reasons. They are offered to consecrate or present something to God. And uh, we can find in the Bible, like uh, in the tabernacle and in the temple of the Lord, the utensils of the Lord and various uh, uh, articles uh, in the temple of the Lord were being uh, uh, consecrated to the Lord by offering a sacrifice. And the sacrifice, the sacrifice is to give something to God in order to obtain his favor. If we want some gift, if we want some favor from the Lord, if we want good rain and we go and offer a sacrifice to the Lord. That was the practice. And it is a symbol of establishing a covenant. If you read the Old Testament in various places, the sacrifices will be now for in order to uh, establish a covenant. For example, uh, the covenant established during the time of Noah. Noah offered the sacrifice and the, the rainbow came and the Lord said, I will not destroy the earth anymore with the water. And we also know the Abrahamic covenant. The Abrahamic covenant was established when God asked Abraham to go and offer two birds uh, as a, uh, you know, in order to establish 
the covenant, even Moses. Mosaic covenant was established by the sacrifice that he offered at the tabernacle. So there are so many uh, instances where we can see the sacrifice has been offered in order to establish uh, a covenant. In fact, the new covenant we Christians are believing and where we put our faith and find our salvation, it is also established on the sacrifice that was offered by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And the sacrifice is also offered as a token of thanksgiving. And uh, in, order to, uh, in order to atone sin, also people have offered sacrifices, especially uh, the sacrifices offered by Abel and Cain. They, those sacrifices are token of thanksgiving. In fact, even no other thing we can consider as a token of uh, thanksgiving. And... Uh, and there are various places, the especially in Leviticus, we find where God talks about um, the uh, sacrifice for sin. And those are the uh, sacrifices offered in order to atone sin. And these sacrifices were offered before God ever even asked about it. This may be surprising for my, my statement, my find like that. But because we find in the Bible that Abel and Cain offered the sacrifice, but we don't know who taught them or who asked them to offer the sacrifice. Probably Adam might have practiced, started practicing it. So from Adam, Abel and Cain might have learned. But one thing very clearly we can see that God did not ask for any sacrifice till that moment. And uh, uh, not only that, uh, Noah came and offered sacrifice. Did God ask Noah to offer sacrifice? We don't find anywhere. In the Abraham's case, we find God was asking Abraham to uh, perform certain sacrifices, especially as I said previously, that uh, uh, in order to establish a covenant. And he also asked Abraham to offer his own son. So that's one place where uh, Abraham was asked to offer sacrifice. But till then, till the time of Abraham, Nowhere we find that God was asking the people to offer any sacrifice, but people were practicing it. Uh, I, that is the very reason I said. Uh, the sacrifice offered by Abel and Cain is more of thanksgiving in nature. That's why they brought the first fruit of uh, their produce. Abel brought the uh, an animal offered to God and Cain brought the first fruit and he offered uh, to the Lord. So it, it looks more like it's a Thanksgiving offering. And uh, when and where and how these uh, sacrifices to appease God started that we do not have any records in the Bible, but the practice has been evolved into the lives of uh, uh, Abraham and uh, their family itself. And before Abraham coming to the Lord itself, this practice was uh, already found. And, and we also find that God asked for sacrifices in certain places. In the beginning, God did not ask for any sacrifice, through which I am saying that sacrifices were offered even before God ever asked for it. And there are a particular place from which God started asking for sacrifice. At least the text seems like that, especially we find it in a, uh, from book of uh, Exodus and why in a wide range uh, in book of Leviticus, we can find that. And, uh, and at the same time, Bible also says that God did not desire any sacrifice. Psalms chapter four, uh, 40th Psalm verse 7 to 9, where God says, I do not desire for any sacrifice. In, a, if, if, in one more uh, quotation, which is very much fam famous among uh, the Christians, that is, obedience is better than sacrifice. Where God himself is say, say, saying, like, you know, I seek obedience, not the sacrifice. He is not for sacrifice. He is not very much interested in that. But he is very much interested in the obedience and, and uh, the attitude of people towards him. So God did not deserve for sacrifices. And there are a uh, bunch of scriptures that speak about it, especially if you read book of Isaiah, you'll find so many places that God tells, I got tired of your sacrifices and I hate your sacrifices. And that's what uh, uh, God says in Isaiah chapter 
uh, 1 verse uh, 11 to 14. In these places, God says, I really don't want, I hate your sacrifices. And surprisingly, even Isaiah and as well as in Jeremiah, we find God himself saying like, I never asked you for any sacrifice. And at the same time, he also says, you never gave me any sacrifice. This is surprising. If you read uh, the Old Testament, especially from the time of uh, uh, Exodus, how many sacrifices were being given uh, during the time of Exodus? And how many sacrifices did Solomon give during the dedication of the temple? It's written some thousands of uh, animals he slaughtered uh, uh, as part of the dedication of the temple. But it is surprising for us to see that God says, I have never asked for any sacrifice and you have never given me any. You did not give me a sweet cane sacrifice. You did not give me oil sacrifice. So that, that, that is something surprising, which tells us it is very much important for us to understand the purpose that God has behind these sacrifices. And uh, um, uh, special, uh, just a reputation like Noah's sacrifice is a sacrifice of thanksgiving and uh, Abraham offered uh, sacrifices that provides uh, the first the first time the concept of substitution has come from the story of uh, Abraham in Abraham sorry in Genesis 22 when God asked uh, uh, Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac Abraham was about to offer the sacrifice but God has provided a ram for the sacrifice through which the, the very name of the Lord has come. In fact, it is not a name, basically. Uh, it is a revelation that God had given to the humanity uh, for the sacrifice. He doesn't ask uh, people to bring something to him, but he himself provides uh, we have, through which we brought, I mean, Abraham called it uh, uh, Jehovah Zara, which means God provides. That's where the humanity learned the lesson that God provides sacrifice. And he is not the one who is the bloodthirsty God who seeks for blood and who seeks for sacrifices. And we also find uh, uh, in Leviticus chapter 16, complete description about a sacrifice of atonement, how the atonement sacrifice has to be uh, um, performed. And in Exodus chapter 12, we find another interesting sacrifice, which is Passover lamb. This is also an interesting and unique sacrifice. Uh, we, we about uh, about these two things we'll discuss little later, and and human sacrifice also can be found in uh, in the Bible. It was very much uh, uh, practiced among uh, the various uh, what we what we can call Ethan or pagan uh, religions of of the ancient times, and unfortunately, uh, we can find some human sacrifices in the Bible also. It is surprising when God asked Abraham to sacrifice his son, uh, Isaac, Abraham did not hesitate to do that, which tells the culture very much uh, is uh, used to this practice. And at the same time, King Manasseh, in, we can find in 2 Kings chapter 21, verses 1 to 18, if you read the story, where he offered his own children to Molech. Molech is a god who seeks for uh, uh, child sacrifices. So they have to take uh, children who are below 12 years old and they go and throw some, throw them in fire. Somehow, sometimes they uh, kill them and offer uh, them to uh, Molek. And one interesting uh, uh, statement we can find from Micah chapter 6, verse 7, where Micah prays to the Lord and says, should I offer the fruit of my body for the remission of my sin? Then also, what is the fruit of fruit of the body? Fruit of the body is nothing but the children. So this practice very much very much among the pagan religions, and unfortunately, somehow somehow it was creeped into uh, the Jewish practices also. In spite of God very strongly um, uh, commanding them not to offer the children or not to offer any human sacrifices. But uh, somehow uh, Israel has been influenced by uh, other religions and uh, they, to an extent, they have practiced it. There are a variety of uh, sacrifices and uh, I will just uh, give a 
list of them. If you want to make any note later, if you want, I can share it with you. Uh, there are burnt sacrifices. These are to these are for covering of our sins. We can find them in Leviticus chapter one, verse uh, uh, three to seventeen, and Leviticus chapter six, verse eight to thirteen. There are sin offerings. These are covering of our sins committed in ignorance. The first one was uh, sins committed with the knowledge. Second one was uh, about sins committed in ignorance. And we can find the description about it in Leviticus chapter four, verse one to five, and uh, chapter thirteen. Sorry, uh, Leviticus chapter four, verse one to Leviticus chapter five, verse thirteen, and Leviticus chapter six, uh, verses twenty-four to thirty. And these are offered for individuals as well as for uh, uh, the nation itself. And these sacrifices are wide where there are wide varieties. Like you know, based on the financial situation of the person, the sacrifice was asked. And the rich people were asked to uh, get rams and goats and may uh, uh, rams and goats and bulls. And uh, poor people were asked to bring two birds. And at last, we can find. Even poor people can bring even a flower, like some atta can be taken and offered as sacrifice. And the other variety of uh, sacrifices we can find is guilt or trespass, trespass sacrifice. This is for the forgiveness of sins that are not intentional. We can find in uh, same Leviticus chapter five, verse fourteen to chapter six, verse seven and seven. Uh, Leviticus seven one to ten. There are uh, grain offerings which are Memorial to God, and there are peace offerings that is for the fellowship with God, and uh, with, in other words, uh, these are to 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 make make God comfortable so that they can go and have uh, fellowship within uh, with the Lord, just like uh, how uh, the high priest offers sacrifice before he goes and does the ritual, and then uh, there is the free will offering. Uh, where people bring their first fruit and all they offer uh, thank, uh, offer to God, uh, we can call them as even thanksgiving uh, sacrifices. And there are vows uh, offered to mark the end of a vow. So if somebody said, "I will do it," they complete. They have done that, and at the at the end of it, they do offer a sacrifice. And the praise or praise sacrifice, which is part of. Worship in the Old Testament, especially if you see that sacrifice and worship are very closely connected, and which we cannot separate because uh, their worship is not like how we are worshiping. Jesus said, uh, "We we worship in truth and spirit. We are worship sitting in the church and at home and at any part. Even we worship the Lord in the from the bathrooms. We praise God. We sing praises to Lord, and uh, through our acts and all, we worship the Lord. But in the Old Testament." Uh, their uh, concept of worship was uh, completely connected to sacrifices. Uh, if you remember, in Genesis chapter twenty-two, uh, where God asks uh, Abraham to offer his son Isaac, Abraham takes his son to the Mount Moriah. Before going to the uh, uh, mountain, he tells his servants, "I and the lad will go yonder and worship the Lord, and we will come back." So what for what purpose Abraham was going up? He was going up to give his son as a sacrifice to the Lord. But he says, "And we are going to worship the Lord." The very act of the sacrifice is worship for the people in the ancient times, especially the people in the Old Testament times. Let us look at the etymology of this word, which gives us a little more clarity about the sacrifices. The Hebrew word for sacrifice is korban. It sounds much similar to our Hindi word and Urdu word, right? Korban is the word that is used to explain about sacrifices, and this word uh, we can find forty times in the book of Leviticus, and thirty-eight times in the book of Numbers, and two times in book of Ezekiel. Okay, and what is the meaning of the word? Korban means be near. Or close, or draw near, bringing somebody close, or we going close to somebody. Be near or draw near. That is the meaning of the word korban, and this indicates the purpose of the sacrifices is to bring man. 
closer to God. Especially the uh, uh, Hebrew and Jewish understanding of the sacrifices is bringing people closer to God. Unfortunately, many people did not understand it. Probably they might have been influenced by the uh, nations around them and the religions around them. <coughs> we find that in the Old Testament, many of the Jews uh, understood uh, this particular uh, concept and uh, performed sacrifices with this understanding. But basically, the sacrifice means bringing somebody close to us. That tells the purpose of the sacrifice also. According to the etymology of this very word, the purpose of the sacrifice is bringing people closer to God. That is the purpose of sacrifice. Having said that, I would like to bring before you one funny question. That is, why all the sacrifices or why all the uh, substances that are offered in the sacrifice are food? Have you ever uh, thought about it? All the sacrifices that are offered in the Old Testament are food. You take a bull, you take a ram, you take a goat, you take birds, you take flour, even sugar, oil. All these things are food. Why these sacrifices are always food? Have you thought about that? Let me give you an example from the scripture. There are many places, everywhere these words only you find. But one, one Bible verse I would like to give you. That is Leviticus chapter 19, verse 5. And if you offer a sacrifice of a peace offering to the Lord, you shall offer it of your own free will. It shall be eaten the same day you offer it, and on the next day. And if any remains until the third day, it shall be burnt in the fire. So God says you shall bring the offering. What to bring? Food and you shall eat it. All these sacrifices are, you know, you know, even if a bull is offered, they have to kill it and they have to eat. In the, <coughs> in the pagan religions, the sacrificial animal would be burnt on the altar. But in the Jewish religion, it is not. Jewish uh, uh, sacrificial system, it is not like that. The animal would be cut outside and they bring and they sprinkle the blood on the altar. The rest, actually, they do in the background. Uh, they cut the animals and they share it among the priests and they eat. Even look at these pagans. Uh, in pagan worships and various, uh, some other religious people do. They go and they offer the animal. They stay in the temple presence. They cook it and nicely they eat and they come. And Hyderabad is very much uh, known for that. People go to near lakes and all where uh, there will be some temples. They offer animals, fully get drunk and eat and come back in the evening. So most of the religions, most of the sacrifices are like, like that. Why? It is always about uh, food. Food is one of the best ways where we can bring people together and have fellowship in a very simple language. If you want to have spend a, spend some quality time with somebody, there is no better uh, uh, there is no better plan than inviting them for lunch or for a dinner, where people come, share food, and they eat. So all these sacrifices are like that. God asks people to bring food. They may and let's cut and let's all come and have a meal together. That is the thing we find in all the sacrifices. And look at the Luke chapter 22, uh, where the sacrifice of Jesus only is concerned. And we all practice it, we, which we call Holy Communion. Right? Let us consider this. This is also similar to that. Luke 22, verse 17. This is the Last Supper. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take uh, take this and divide it amongst yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the wine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread, gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them, 
saying, this is my body, which is given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper saying, this is, uh, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shared, so which is shared for you. So the Holy Communion, which we are practicing is also, we are eating the bread and uh, so we are eating the flesh and bre uh, blood of Jesus. Of course, we are not talking about transubstantiation, uh, the, which we discussed previously, okay? Which are symbolizing the bread and wine are symbolizing the body and blood of Jesus Christ, and which we are bringing and sharing amongst ourselves, remembering his passion, and in other words, remembering the sacrifice he has made, and we eat it. I really love the word uh, Holy Communion, and there are many other words Christian uses, various Christians use for the Holy Communion. But this word, it ex clearly explains the purpose of the uh, this particular act itself. Holy, which is sacred. Communion, coming together and sharing life. In other words, holy fellowship it is. So just like in the sacrifice here, we are eating the body and blood of Jesus Christ. So the purpose of the sacrifice, according to etymology, as well as according to uh, the acts that are practiced and the uh, you know the practices used uh, while giving while doing these sacrifices, and as well as the holy communion which has been uh, given to us and commanded to us by the Lord Jesus Christ, is about is more about the fellowship. The purpose of sacrifice is not as God is bloodthirsty or he got so very offended, that's why he, uh, if some blood comes, then he would be calmed down. And uh, he cannot forgive people unless somebody punished, or he cannot for forgive people without blood. We may say that, and we may even bring the words, it is written in the Bible, without shedding of the blood, there is no remission of the sin. I truly understand. Without shedding of the blood, there is no remission of the sin. In other words, without shedding of the blood, there is no forgiveness for sins. The word forgiveness is a two-way road. There is somebody who gives forgiveness and there is somebody who receives forgiveness. Okay. Without shedding of the blood, there is no forgiveness. From God said, God does not require any blood sacrifice in order to offer forgiveness. If you bring any condition condition for forgiveness, then it is not a forgiveness at all. Forgiveness by its very nature is unconditional. And our God, he loves us unconditionally. And how could he have a condition? Unless some blood is provided to me, I will not be able to forgive. So at last my son went and he shed his blood so that I can forgive people. It is not that way. But we humans... We won't be able to accept forgiveness unless there is bloodshed. That is the real reason the author of Hebrews says, without shedding of the blood, there is no forgiveness. It is not the requirement for God uh, to offer forgiveness, but it is a requirement for humans to accept forgiveness. Without that, we won't be able to take it. So, Because entire humanity was given into this system. There is no human culture which, which is above this system. Every human culture have gone through this system. And uh, because of that very reason, unless a bloodshed is there, there will, there will be forgiveness of sins. We won't be able to accept it. That is the reason God has to send his son to offer his blood for the remission of our sins. Not because he cannot accept us, but because we cannot accept him. And... Uh, we also may say that, uh, you know, in the Old Testament, uh, this uh, uh, no, sacrifice for sin, atonement has to be done, made. It has to be made with blood. No, 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 no. If you read the Old Testament, especially Book of Leviticus, we understand it is not necessary to offer blood only in order to, uh, uh, blood only for the sacrifice of atonement. Even the flour is offered for the people who are poor. The flour is offered for the this uh, sacrifice of atonement. So this blood thing is basically for us. And uh, if you consider that way, without blood, uh, atonement cannot be happened. We need to look at when Jesus offered himself as a sacrifice. 
Jesus did not die on the day of atonement. Jesus died on the day of Passover. We all know about the Passover sacrifice. The Passover sacrifice was offered the day before Egypt, uh, sorry, Israelites left Egypt. So the Passover sacrifice is, uh, you know, they have to eat also in a certain way. The Passover sacrifice has to be eaten as if they are traveling. They are leaving the place. They have to wear the sandals and they have to tie their, uh, what we call, uh, you know, they, you know, we all know about it very well. There is a certain way we have to participate in the uh, Passover sacrifice. So, the Passover, it tells about the redemption that is going to come the next day. For whose sin the Passover lamb was slain? Just think about it. For whose sin the lamb was uh, cut on the night before the Passover? We don't get any word, even a single word about sin or anything during the Passover thing. It is a sign and it is a confirmation. It is an evidence of tomorrow's redemption. That is which Israelites are going to experience. And of course, the blood which put on the doorposts and all are for protection. And that is a different case. And even we can consider it as a seal of protection. Okay. So the Passover is not for any sins, but it is about redemption. And Jesus died on the day of Passover, which tells us that his death was for our redemption. It is not as, sin, as a uh, sacrifice of atonement. I don't mean Jesus' blood was not for the forgiveness of humans. No. Jesus sacrificed his life, his, uh, his death. Everything is for the forgiveness of humans. Not as if God demands or requires, but because we require it without that we are not able to accept the forgiveness. We all have a very guilty conscience, a conscience of sin. We all need purification. And with blood, all things are purified. That's what the scripture says. And that is the reason if you read Hebrews chapter 9, verses 11 to 27, where he describes about the purpose of this, uh, uh, the blood of Jesus Christ. And uh, I will read it for you. It is a little long. I know, kindly uh, bear with me. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11 to 27. But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. So it is about redemption. And for the blood of the bulls and goats and uh, the ashes of hypho, um, hypho sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh. That is the image we find. With this blood, things are uh, purified. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanses your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. The blood of Jesus cleanses our conscience from dead works. And it cleanses us from guilt. That's what the author of Hebrews says. So, uh, one of the purposes, purification was done with the blood. And that Jesus, the blood of Jesus is uh, doing it perfectly. So, the blood of Jesus cleanses the conscience. And from dead works, it sets us free from that. And for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. Look at, look at what uh, the author of Hebrews is saying. How rich um, uh, perspective and doctrine is he speaking here. The blood of Jesus was shed for the cleansing. What is he cleansing? He is he cleansing the temple. No, he is cleansing our minds itself, our conscience itself. And then his blood is bringing the 
yeah, sorry, because of this reason, he became the mediator of the new covenant. So without this any co guilty conscience and co consciousness of dead works, oh, with them we may not we may not be able to go to the presence of the Lord. That's why he's cleansing us with his blood, and because of which he became the mediator of the new covenant by means of his death, and it is for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant. Look at these words. Jesus died on the day of Passover, which is uh, talking about redemption. Okay, So, for where there is a testament, there must also necessity be the death of the testator. This is another perspective he brings. Uh, for the testament is in force after men are dead since it has no power at all while the testator lives. So if somebody wrote a will and if the, the will will be in uh, power only when the person who wrote the will passes away. So Christ wrote a will about our forgiveness, our redemption and our inheritance and it can be accomplished only through his death. It is not as if uh, without blood God cannot forgive people. Therefore, not even the first covenant was dedicated without blood. So with his blood, he, the new covenant has been dedicated. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats uh, with water, scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the books itself and all the people saying, this is the blood of the covenant uh, which God has commanded you. Then likewise, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels in the, of the ministry. So where we can see the establishment of the covenant as well as the cleansing of uh, or uh, consecration of various articles for the ministry of the Lord. And according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood and without shedding of the blood, there is no remission. That is the context there. It is not... Without shedding of the blood, God cannot forgive us. See, look at everything. It is talking the covenant language. It is talking purification language. So Jesus' blood, it cleanses our conscience. That is, the, well, that is one of the purposes. Therefore, it was necessary that the copies of the things in heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifice than this. For Christ has not entered the holy places, uh, places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Uh, not that we should offer himself often, as a high priest entered the most holy place every year with blood of another. He then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed for men to die once and a half, but after the judgment. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time, apart from sin, for salvation. If you read these verses, we can clearly see the sacrifice of Jesus is to cleanse our conscience, to purify us, to make us confident. To, and it is the establishment of the new covenant where were accepted and it is a very strong uh, uh, message of our redemption. It is. It doesn't speak about the bloodthirsty God who could not accept his children unless some blood has been shed. But the sacrifice of Jesus, Jesus did not die on the cross to change God's mind about us, but he died on the cross to change our mind about God. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is the same. And uh, it is not like God is very angry about us and uh, he wanted to punish us, but Jesus comes and, you know, he dies on the cross and says, see, Jesus, see, Father, I died for their sin. Please, you forgive them. You know, the sacrifice changed God's mind. If the sacrifice of Jesus changed God, the Father's mind, then God changed. Then God, uh, what about the doctrine we call God is immutable? God never change, right? So the sacrifice of Jesus is not to change God's mind about us, but to change our mind about God. Okay, you all are struggling with the guilty conscience. So unless blood, shed, blood is not shed, you won't be able to accept forgiveness. Okay, I'm shedding my blood. Now you accept the forgiveness. That's what cleansing our conscience from our dead works.
So one thing very clearly we can see uh, in Hebrews chapter 9, 11 to 27, that is the blood of Jesus uh, it purifies us and it uh, provides atonement. This atonement, always we think somebody have to take punishment, but it is not necessary. Somebody have to take punishment. And then it is the establishment of the new covenant and it is the dedication of a new generation uh, unto the Lord. So that's what the blood of Jesus talks about. The sacrifice of Jesus talks about. So the primary purpose of sacrifice actually is communion. So the author of Hebrews, he says, uh, uh, he cleanses our conscience. So let us come before the throne of God with confidence. So remember that was right after this. Because Christ has accomplished this, this is the purpose he came he, to bring men and God together and uh, uh, he, to bring heaven and earth together. So he offered his life and he calls us, come to the throne of grace with confidence. We do not have a high priest who could not sympathize with us or empathize with us, but who has been tested in all the, uh, in all the ways and, we, uh, and he is still without sin. So let us come before the throne of God with confidence. That is the purpose. What is the meaning? Definitely, etymology of the word says, bring closer. What does the author of Hebrews say? Come closer. What did Jesus say? Come to me also labor and have heavy laden. I will give you this. Look, the purpose of sacrifices is to bring people close. And God brought it. And that every Sunday we are experiencing as we are participating in the Holy Communion. So uh, I would like to close with one verse. That is Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come to him and he will dine with him. Uh, sorry, and, uh, will dine with him and he with me. We thought why sacrifices are always food? The sacrifices are always food because we can have great communion, fellowship with the food. So that is the purpose of the sacrifice we can find in the Bible. So now I will open it up for a discussion. Please feel free to share your opinions, your questions, if you have any, or you can add anything to what we have discussed. Yes, sir. So you mentioned one of the main purposes of sacrifices was communion with God, fellowship with God, getting closer to God, right? Mm -hmm. But I thought one of the other major purposes also was like, like a sin offering and so on was, you know, offer a sacrifice to atone for your sins, wasn't it? Yeah, he atoned for our sins, sir. but it is not as uh, some payment has to be made to forgive, not in that sense. The atonement is taken place through his blood. We are able to accept his forgiveness. That is the atonement there. It is yeah, not. In the, in the Old Testament, it was kind of a symbolic, you know, like, okay, you have to offer a sacrifice or the animal to atone for your sins. It's not as, 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 as the scripture says, it, the, the, the sacrifice of bulls and goats doesn't really free you from sin, but it was symbolic. God wanted you to like enact the sacrifice of Jesus, it's like, you know, you're doing it for the bull and the goat. So in that sense, uh, it was also for uh, atonement of the sins in the Old Testament, at least, right? Definitely it is for the atonement uh, of the sins. I'm, I'm also not saying it's not for the atonement of the sins. Yeah. It is for the atonement of the sins, but not as, uh, you know, angry God where uh, who will be no, satisfied with the blood. And the second thing we need to realize is uh, the Old Testament things, whatever we say, they are, you use a word symbolic, that is very good. And uh, even better word, uh, uh, the author of Hebrew uses is shadows. Mm -hmm. Those are shadows. shadows. Yeah, the realities are found in the New Testament. So we have to interpret the shadows through the reality, but we should never interpret the re reality through the shadows. So what we try to do most of the times is whatever is written in the Old Testament about sacrifice or whatever, those are shadows. We try, to, we take that and we try to fit Jesus inside that. That is, a, that is a mistake we would be doing. What we need to do is we need to take Jesus and the New Testament message and try to fit the Old Testament shadows and try to fit them under Jesus. That's what we should be doing. All right. 
Yes, Bertie. Uh, in the New Testament, uh, with Christ having, uh, you know, provided us, done everything uh, that we could not do and brought us into a right relationship, into holy communion with Him, God mentioned that offer yourselves as a living sacrifice, uh, which is your reasonable service. Absolutely. Uh, so, uh, would you like to uh, maybe just elaborate on that? Uh, offering ourselves because of Christ now, because what Christ has done, you know, He has fulfilled everything, made every made you know made the way for us and made fellowship for us possible, Holy Communion. Now you, you you know your body with a with a right conscience. Just elaborate on that, please. Uh, I, I guess that verse is very clear and it speaks for itself. But uh, even then, uh, it tells us like you know that we we have our conscience is cleansed now so let us come before god with confidence number one and our conscience is cleansed from dead works so let us not go back to the dead works again and now we have been established in the covenant with the lord where no one tells another do not commit any sin or do, do you know you do this but he he puts his spirit in us who makes us jealous to do all the good works that is a new covenant we are in new covenant so uh, these are implications and we can develop uh, on these, you know, thousands of them we can bring. But the word uh, sacrifice, you know, uh, offer yourselves as a sacrifice to the Lord. It tells uh, about uh, yeah, appropriate behavior in the light of Christ's sacrifice for us and what he has accomplished for us. Thanks, Praveen. Thanks, Venisa, uh, ma'am, please go ahead. Venisa, ma'am, please go ahead and ask your question. Okay. Uh, I just want to thank you, Parveen, for this topic, having this topic uh, today. Because as I mentioned earlier in one of our Bible studies that I had stopped reading the Bible because of this, uh, I came to a certain part of the Bible where uh, this kept on about the sacrifices, these burnt offerings and this and that. And I kept thinking to myself, what kind of a God is this when so many animals were being killed, so many sacrifices were happening. So that put my mood on. I had stopped reading the Bible altogether. Now you have made it so clear that God, God was not the one who were asking for the sacrifices. He was not asking directly that you are supposed to uh, kill the animals and give burnt offerings. I mean, God didn't ask for it. Nowhere in the Bible is it written that God asked that you have to give the burnt sacrifices. So that is one thing my mind is clear about now. And uh, the second thing that I'm uh, clear about now is that uh, this, burn, this sacrifice in the New Testament is not there. It means God has sent Jesus Christ for the new covenant. And the new covenant was not to uh, offer sacrifices, but Jesus himself sacrificed himself for us. Now, uh, that, that is another one thing what you explained to me, uh, explained to us and clearly know that uh, it is not that God's, God has told me what I think personally. God has not told me that I am sending my son Jesus to, to die for you and shed his blood to forgive you. Means Jesus is doing it for me that I, I know that I can go to the father that somebody has already shed his blood and doing what I so long it was in my mind that God is sending Jesus only through Jesus by him shedding his blood that I am forgiven. Now I know that I'm not forgiven in that way. There is a there is another way that actually I am forgiven. So these two things have become clear in my mind now. So thank you, Parveen. Yes, um, a couple of things to clarify from what you have said. Uh, especially we find in certain places in the Old Testament, if you read Leviticus and all, where you feel like you know God is asking them to bring, offer this sacrifice in this particular manner, that particular manner. This is actually like, you know, the entire humanity is under this sacrificial system. As I said, before Moses comes and speaks about these sacrifices, already humanity is under that system. So, in order to help us bring us out of it, you know, he chose this particular system. He entered into that system. 
to set us free from that system we use the word, we always say the word christ uh, fulfill the law what is the law primarily speaking about the law primarily speaks about the sacrificial system basically so how jesus fulfill the law by becoming sacrifice by himself and he resurrected through which he validated it so when we are into that uh, uh, when humanity is into that sacrificial system god chose to come inside the sacrificial system to bring us out of that sacrifice sacrificial system that's what he has done throughout the old testament that's why we find the verses in leviticus god said bring uh, do sacrifice in so and so manner with these so and so but in isaiah he says i never asked for anything and i zermay says you never gave me anything you know this ki- kind of contradiction we find it is because of that it is when we read the bible arthur moses when he writes he, he writes how he understand so certain things we have to keep in our mind that takes more time to explain anyway so god is coming into our system to set us free from that system that is number 1 number 2 definitely the forgiveness of jesus uh, sorry forgiveness of our sin happened through jesus <laughs> as i said this forgiveness is not one way it is two ways god has already forgiven us without uh, jesus coming and dying for us before the foundation of the world itself he accepted us to be holy and blameless and because of the blood of jesus only we are able to go to, to the presence of the lord because of the blood of jesus only we are able to receive that forgiveness so the forgiveness is not complete unless somebody gives and somebody receives both it should happen if that if any of this part are missing the forgiveness did not complete so that's where jesus also plays major role so we should not misunderstand that god, uh, god the forgiveness i got or god uh, my forgiveness uh, has nothing to do with jesus that we should never be misunderstood like that what is mr poppins has to say uh, you're on mute uncle mr franklin poppins you're on mute yes sir can you hear me Yes, yes, we can hear you, uh, sir. Uh, please, sir, please explain uh, uh, the word propitiation. He is a propitiation for our sins. The word propitiation is actually payment done uh, in its fullness, in a satisfactory manner. Okay, uh, so that word has to be taken in a way, uh, especially in uh, book of Hebrews and book of Ephesians. Also, we find. so what he has offered it it is complete and it doesn't need to add anything here. we don't need to add anything not now not even later it is the word it is talking about the completion satisfaction uh, in that particular activity so the word satisfaction has to be taken so what christ has done it is sufficient for us and we don't need to add anything and we don't not, not now not even later that's what it talks about thank you sir thank you sir any if, more comments uh, yeah if um, uh, good evening everyone if i'm allowed to add to that uh, add to the discussion rather uh mark 10 25 or 45 i'm not sure of the verse maybe we can look at it it says the the lord jesus came to serve and not to be served yeah and it goes on to say that he pay, he was a ransom he paid the ransom so maybe this will make it easier for us to understand what do we become ransom to sometimes to our jobs sometimes to our, the lust sometimes to uh, you know yeah. our addictions right we become so much uh, addicted and so we pay ransom to all that but here jesus has come down so that he can pay all that ransom for us so we don't have to pay it is not for you know blood has to be shed like in the old testament but it is about instead of us paying because see at the end of the day uh, the the lord's word says 
that in him if he remain is life so in him as long as we are in him that ransom he has paid so that we don't have to pay our ransom to our addictions our ransom of uh, you know to corruption our ransom to all these other every other addiction that we might have every other weakness that we might have and i find that so uh, intriguing that sacrifice was looked as a service right that was serving us it is not to serve his own purposes it is to serve us so that we might not go through all of that so that we don't have to pay ransom and get uh, you know weakened by all of this we can be us as in our full uh, fullness of the lord you know in the exact way that he has created us to be he has made us to be you know to attain that 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 was again to go back uh, what we didn't in the convention to attain the fullness of the measure of jesus christ when can that happen that can happen only uh, you know when we are in jesus and so that we can attain it that ransom was paid so that we don't have to fall to all these these um, uh, down things of the world the second thing i wanted to add was is indians especially will understand this uh, particular example we like free things right but then it pinches if it pinches like petrol abhi 109 rupees in pune which is expensive but then uh, that little thing also more you know it it pinches us right only when you pinch it then you have more become more careful as well so when we are in jesus for us when we make jesus our life that is when that pinching happens and that holy spirit talks to us and makes us understand that uh, you know for me for my so that i i can overcome these things the lord has uh, paid the ransom so for indians especially i feel this is an excellent thing that <laughs> free i say god gave free salvation yes but we can make it our own that salvation only when we will be in him and because we will be in him we will feel every you know this is why also it is written that every stripe that you bore on the back why 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 does it matter every stripe because every stripe if you are in him we will feel that stripe every beating each one beating that he got from that uh, with that corda or the or the uh, hunter every that beating we can feel it right it didn't come cheap so that feeling comes only when we abide in him consciously and we say only in him so that sacrifice also is a purpose to remind us that it is not for anything it is for us so that we might not falter baba you don't have to pay for your corruption you don't have to go to jail i have paid of course uh, if you do we have to obey the laws of the land but then uh, i'm talking about spiritually mentally emotionally you know that is paid for us and so for me it is a big thing that his sacrifice is a service to us yeah quite interesting uh, thoughts uh, especially the ransom is another aspect uh, or another uh, uh, method through which bible speaks about uh, the death of jesus thank you shanti for uh, reminding us about it yes venasa okay <clears throat> what i what i want to say is that uh, see even though we know that our sins are forgiven and the ransom is paid but still we have the guilt of of the sin okay uh, like like what i do every day is i also pray to take away this guilt and the shame of sin that that are that are still there in our thoughts in our in our words in our actions okay so if jesus came and he suffered and died to take away this then why do we still have this guilt and this shame now how do we know that this 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 sin that we have committed okay we have committed it and is it going to be forgiven i mean do we have to still acknowledge it when when our um, what is that is a day of reckoning comes and we we have to give an answer to what we do so we have to say about it it's not that it is it is there it is uh, taken from the book it is it is still the account is there still written in the book 
so why why do we still have this guilt and the shame that we have committed it whether it was years ago whatever okay if we have stopped doing it if we are still not committing that sin but then i always ask god to take it away from me to why does this memory still be there okay that's that's a quite interesting um, question and uh, many people ask this okay let me answer this uh, in this way i know uh, it we already crossed seven and so you know as we discussed previously if any, if you have any engagements you know please feel free to leave otherwise we can continue in our discussion so coming to the uh, venessa your question uh, why do we feel guilt we need to ask the question where does the guilt come from most of the times guilt comes from ourselves number 2 from devil number 3 from the religion god never spoke about god never made anybody guilty adam is there adam felt guilty among, uh, for himself he felt he is naked and he is shy that came from himself and number 2 the devil makes people guilty okay yeah he uh, he walked through the friends of uh, uh, what what we'll call uh, the job and he tries to make him feel you might have done something wrong that's why you are going through this accept accept some way we uh, wants to make us feel guilty and you remember the story of uh, the woman caught in adultery woman was feeling shameful and who were making her guilty more and more guilty and it was the religious people around uh, around her uh, somebody explained uh, this particular incident this way when the woman was caught woman caught in adultery was brought and uh, the people asked what shall we do with this woman jesus stood down and started writing on the ground and there are hundreds of messages people have spoken about what jesus was writing okay so somebody said in this way jesus stood down and started writing because the woman was already suffering in guilt she was brought in the very act means you can imagine you know how she her condition would be so the moment he stood down all the people's eyes which were on that lady especially all these religious people also who brought her okay now as soon as he started writing something on the ground those eyes were taken off from that lady and they were on jesus so that the lady gets some time to cover herself uh, cover her guilt and shame so we find one thing from the bible god never made anyone feel guilty and he won't do that the guilt and guilty conscience that comes from ourselves from the devil from the religious people it is not from god that is why we read the verse from hebrews no we do not have a high priest who cannot empathize with our weaknesses but he was tempted and tested in every way possible but he was without sin so don't feel guilty don't hesitate let us come to the throne of god with confidence that is the thing we have to come to the throne of god with confidence uh, you said uh, just because uh, uh, we feel guilty and all let me tell you one let me ask you one question if anything written in the bible once is it important or not if anything written in bible once it is important isn't it i believe all of you agree if anything written 64 times in bible then is it important it is very much important 64 times in the bible it is written that you are a saint you are righteous you are no more a sinner christ made us righteous and holy that is our new identity that's what bible speaks not once 64 times so now you choose whether you want to believe or not so the blood of jesus cleanses our conscience or minds from dead works you one last example i'll give for this Corinthian church if you read first corinthians we understand corinthian church was one of the worst churches in the early church time they have all sorts of problems and them you know how apostle paul addresses to the saints in corinth they have all the sins them apostle calls paul calls saints 
so you and me we also have some weaknesses we fail in certain things in certain places and all still we are failing we will be failing but still god calls us saints and righteous and holy people he chose you to be a holy generation for himself without the word uses is without blame without any blame so when god says you are blameless you don't have rights to blame yourself also okay uh, guilt tripping yourself and that's what i'm talking about uh, mrs nakat saying something you are muted <laughs> jesus says i will blot out all your sins you don't have to remember the old ones now you are a new person in christ so they are blotted out forever and just one thing <clears throat> it is not our right it, it's not that we are made righteous it is that we are jesus is righteousness is imputed to us and then god looks at us as being righteous in christ we are really not righteous as such until of course our uh, regeneration and glorification yeah. but because of jesus sacrifice his righteousness is imputed to us and then god looks at us as being righteous so jesus I just a minor uh, That's, that's that's true sir the christ righteousness has been given to us in fact uh, mm-hmm. ephesians 2:24 i guess uh, 4:24 it says sir uh, put on your new man who was created in true righteousness and holiness so let us not bring the old man again and uh, put on ourselves and new covenant says in which god says i will remember your sins no more when god says that i will remember your sins no more why should we remember and uh, right. guilt ourselves yeah. but sometimes people are like uh, confused that look now jesus died for me i have become righteous it's not that that you will you have become righteous it jesus is righteous and has been imputed to us and then god considers us as righteous any more thoughts good okay Uh, we'll take this last uh, thought from Vanessa. <laughs> so, is uh, okay. I maybe it is not concerning this topic, but uh, but this this thought is still in my mind that uh, as I said that I used to pray only to the Lord God, my Father. I never in my prayers I never ever used to say like Holy Spirit or Lord Jesus Christ. i i always believe that there is only one father one god so i used to but after coming to know that there is the holy spirit there is the lord jesus christ and i okay now i pray to the father i pray to lord jesus christ i pray to the holy spirit but uh, i i still like whole heartedly whole heartedly i am not there like with jesus christ in my mind it is still that jesus christ is also my father and so sometimes when when i'm praying then i think that oh my god now i have to mention lord jesus christ so so i pray to god the father almighty then i pray to lord jesus christ taking his name but then whole heartedly it is not coming so doesn't god know he knows that vanessa you are praying but you, when you are mentioning lord jesus christ your whole heart is not in it so doesn't he um, me my father lord god the father i think he understands because my conscience is always pricking me i think he understands that if if i am praying to lord god the father i am including his son lord jesus christ also in it because <laughs> i have been praying whole my whole life this way so I, i think he forgives me i just every time subconsciously it keeps pricking me and i don't feel very comfortable and i i feel that i am doing some wrong if i don't mention the lord jesus christ yeah. so yeah nothing to worry you already got the answer and uh, you said god doesn't mind and he doesn't need to forgive also the bible says in john 17 Jesus says I am in the father father is in me so if you are talking to one person you are talking to the person inside also so one last uh, statement is Jesus said if you have seen me you have seen the father so if you have talked if you spoke to Jesus you spoke to the father also 
If you have seen him, you have seen the father. Then if you have spoken to him, you have spoken to the father also. So God doesn't have any of this ego. You took the name of my father, not the son. So he won't get any upset. Don't be worried. And uh, he, they are in each other. The father, son is in the father. Father is in the son. They are in the Holy Spirit. So uh, there is no problem. You don't need to feel sad about it. Uh, you don't need to become too conscious about it also. He under, our God understands the intentions of the heart. So don't be worried about your words. He understands our hearts. Okay. Okay. With that note, uh, perhaps uh, we can close our Bible study with a uh, word of prayer. So, can I request uh, Mr. Poppins to close in prayer? Yes. Gracious Lord, our loving Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to come together and to study your word, learn and grow. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father, for being with Praveen, sir, and helping him, Lord, to share the word today. Thank you, Lord. Lord, you have ordained, Father, that we grow in knowledge and grow in grace. And thank you, Lord, for this wonderful opportunity. A time, Lord, when we will share our thoughts and we will, we, we will ask our questions and we will seek clarifications and come closer to you. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we pray that uh, you will be with each and every one of us and help us, Father, to grow in your knowledge and grace, Lord, and be with those who could not join in for various reasons. Thank you, Father. May your presence be with us and help us, Lord, to grow as your dear children, always, wherever we are. In Jesus' name we ask all this. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you all. See you all uh, next Sunday or so next Wednesday.